our first presenter will cover the module two of the diabetes guideline. Our second presenter will cover nutrition and COVID-19. And our final presenter for the evening will cover physical activity, diabetes and physical activity. So at this time, our Zoom poll has ended and we will now go to our first presenter who will present on the Diabetes Guidelines, Module 2. And this will cover healthy lifestyle counseling. So our first presenter is no stranger to Carrefour and the region. Her name is Dr. Christine Bocage. She's a registered public health nutritionist, currently employed at the Caribbean Public Health Agency as a senior technical officer food security and nutrition. She has over 25 years of experience in public health, working with member states in the areas of policy development, program planning, implementation and evaluation, guidelines development and implementation research. Her current work at CARFO includes the provision of technical support to its member states in the area of food and nutrition. She also serves on a few CARICOM regional technical committees. Dr. Bakaj is a graduate of the University of the West Indies with a bachelor's degree in agriculture and a master's degree in nutrition and a PhD in human ecology. Please let us know, pay attention and give her full undivided attention to Dr. Bakaj one of our distinguished experts and panelists for this evening. Thank you. Dr. Bakash, the panel. Thank, thank you, Dr. Davidson, and good evening, participants and colleagues. Um, this afternoon, I, are you all seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, I think you sure just need to. It's on show. Okay, so good afternoon. And as Dr. Davidson said, I'm going to be looking at module two healthy lifestyle counseling um, of the CARFA guidelines for the management of diabetes in primary care in the Caribbean. For this presentation, I want to take you through um, sort of step-by-step -step the various sections of the module. But before I do that, I'll just give a quick introduction to the guidelines. Then I go into nine sections of the module, looking at supporting lifestyle modification, nutrition management, the nutrition care process, nutrition information, guiding healthy choices, which is a main area for this module, physical activity guidelines, guidelines for self-management, critical as well, risk behavior avoidance, are we looking at smoking and alcohol, lifestyle recommendations, and the role of the healthcare team, that's very critical. Now, the CARFA guidelines on the management of diabetes in primary care in the Caribbean provides a strategic approach to improving diabetes health outcomes by providing simple directives on key aspects of care for persons with diabetes. Now, there have been previous versions of guidelines of care, and these were developed in 1995, 1998, and 2006. The younger people may, or persons may be more familiar with the 2006 version. And in 2004, the Caribbean Food and Nutrition Institute also developed protocols for the nutritional management of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension in the Caribbean. And I believe many persons in the field of nutrition and dietetics are still using some information from that. Now, the new CARFA guidelines were developed in collaboration with the OECS. And those guidelines were based, these guidelines are based on the WHO Hearts and the WHO package of the Central NCD intervention commonly known as Pool 10. Now, the, the guidelines are set up differently to any other guidelines we've had before. We are calling it a modular approach expanded because we never really had a modular approach. We did have sections in other guidelines where they were actually looking at screening and everybody else was in there. And it, it wasn't just, it wasn't mixed up, but it wasn't as um, directed as it is now. So our module, our guidelines have five modules. Module one, we looked at last week that looked at evidence-based treatment protocols for diabetes. Module two is healthy lifestyle counseling, which we will do today. 
And then there are three other modules, one for caregivers, another one assessing essential medication and the trip to looking at systems for monitoring. In the guidelines, there's a nice quick check where you can check to see which of the modules you are interested in. It's there, it states what each module has and what it entails. And of course, who are the who should be the target users. And of course, we're looking at the chronic care model as well in the development of this, um, these guidelines. We did look at that. Now, this slide just shows some of the topics that I mentioned previously. These are the nine areas that I'm going to the target. So I will move on because each one of these I'm going to go in detail. The first area or section of the, the guidelines I want to look at is supporting lifestyle modification. And supporting lifestyle modification in this section, we, looks at, we look at models of behavior change, motivational interviewing, counseling, group education, and mental well-being. And just to let you know that the motivation interviewing, the counseling and the group education, these are critical skill sets that we must have to be able to use these guidelines. Now, the first one we want to look at is models of behavior change. And why are we looking at this? We know that converting knowledge to practice can be challenging because in reality, we do think that each person is at the same stage, but in reality, not everyone is willing to change and not everyone is at the same stage. So within the guidelines, we are using the trans-theoretical model or stages of change model, which some of you might be familiar with. And in this particular model, you need to assess, assess at what stage each individual is at so that you can gear your counseling accordingly. Are the, are the, is the person at pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, sorry for the title there, action, maintenance, or identification, okay? Lifestyle counseling by healthcare team members encourages clients to change undesirable and unhealthy habits. And this is a critical stage because they're not pre-contemplation, they're not even considering any change at all, okay? And the people in maintenance, you want to make sure that you continue there with them, the identification, this is a way of life for them, it's like brushing. So we need to understand the state at which individual is at so that we can counsel accordingly. Now in this um, section as well, you have pointers and, and tips um, for supporting lifestyle modification. And this particular one tells you how you can go about providing support to clients to encourage behavior change by engaging communication skills, assessing clients' knowledge, attitudes, and practices. Um, identifying current nutrition and lifestyle practices that require change, prioritizing nutrition and lifestyle change needs, educating clients, and discussing possible changes on how they can be made with the clients. And with the client is important because we don't want to tell the, the client what to do. We want to work with them. And if we work with them, it's, it's, it's more probable or possible that they would um, actually do that change. Motivational interviewing, important. This approach engages the client and emphasizes client autonomy. It, it gives the client an opportunity to work with the health professional to actually um, develop some goals. Now, in doing motivational interviewing, you really need to be able to pounce a problem. And in this, this guidelines, um, we focus on two categories of of learning, listening and learning skills and confidence and support skills. And some of you may, be, um, ex may have been exposed to these um, skills. The listening and learning skills are things like using helpful nonverbal communication, asking open questions, using responses and gestures that show interest, reflecting on what the client says so that they, 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 they see that you're listening, empathize with them, show them that you understand how they feel because some of them will come to you and they may be depressed and so on. Avoid words which will sound gentle. So these listening and learning skills, when you use them, the client will give you information so that you can go through your nutrition care process, nutrition assessment very easily. Confidence and support, you really want to use some of these skills by accepting what they, they think or feel, recognizing and praising some of the things that they do, because you know, at the end of the day, you don't want when they come into you and they reach a certain stage, you scold them for not reaching further. You have to praise them for at least trying to do what they do. And this individual will continue to come to you and want to speak with you. 
We are also using something that has been tried and proven is the Libra approach. And this was developed and tested by UNICEF and it works. So these steps say you need to greet the client with respect and kindness, ask open questions, listen to what they have to say, identify key problems, discuss options, recommend and negotiate a small doable action, don't overwhelm them, and agree and get them to agree to try to hope. And this slide wasn't really meant for you to read, but to let you know that with respect to motivating, um, supporting lifestyle modification um, and group education, that you have information that you can follow, um, recommendations for group education, as well as requirements for organizing a group education program for clients. And why do we want to see this group education? Group education is important. It can help improve the knowledge and skills required by persons with diabetes to, to be able to achieve proper self-care and manage their condition. Persons with diabetes can encourage and motivate each other as they strive to achieve mastery of the recommended lifestyle changes. And sometimes these group education things can happen in the community by diabetes association or certain groups, but they must be trained to do this kind of education and it helps. We are accustomed to the one-on-one -on -one in the community. It's, it's also important to do these group sessions as well. The last area for this section in supporting lifestyle modification is mental well-being. Um, some persons may not be aware, but when persons are diagnosed initially with diabetes, some of them become scared. Sorry, Dr. Bakash, we, your sound um, has just dropped. Okay, thank you. Are you hearing me now? Okay. Yes, could you just repeat? Okay, I'm saying the, the last section of this, 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 um, area of supporting lifestyle modification looks at mental well-being because what happens is when persons are, are first diagnosed with diabetes, all sorts of um, false fallacies, misconceptions go through their head, they start to get scared and so on and so forth. And some of them become depressed and we really need to look out for these things. Depression can affect treatment adherence and worsen prognosis. Persons with diabetes should be screened with a validated tool such as patient health estimate tool, PHQ2, that was developed by IDF in 2017. Now, a PH2 cutoff point of three is optimal for screening as an and is indicative of a 75% or greater probability of depression, depression being present. When this happens, a full psychiatric assessment should be conducted and appropriate management initiated. These clients should be referred accordingly. And again, very useful in the guidelines, you have the questionnaire there that you can refer to. The next section of the guidelines that I want to look at very briefly is nutrition management. Now, appropriate nutritional intake is integral to the successful co-management of diabetes. It is important to take a nutritional history on all clients with diabetes. Based on the physician's clinical findings, some clients will be referred for comprehensive nutrition assessment and intervention. All members of the health team should support the care of the client by initiating a conversation around lifestyle and measures that the client is willing and able to adopt for desirable health outcomes. The next section, the nutrition care process, which many um, dietitians and nutritionists are familiar with. This is um, highlighted in the document as well as actually playing a critical role in the, in the guidelines, in the manual, in the guidelines, sorry. The nutrition care process is the systematic approach and the gold standard for conducting an individualized and comprehensive nutrition assessment and developing a care plan. It is therefore recommended that dietitians and nutritionists use this process. I am not going to go into this process because I know the next speaker will be speaking about this, but just to let you know that in the manual, we have the nutrition care process. The nutrition care process has four phases of steps. Phase one, nutrition assessment. Phase two, nutrition diagnosis. Phase three, intervention. Phase four, dietary monitoring and evaluation. In phase one, Right here is where you do a comprehensive nutritional assessment and it involves what we call ABCDs of, of nutritional assessment. A for anthropometric, B for biochemical, C for clinical, and D for dietary. 
assessment leads to identification of key nutritional problems and it leads you into phase two. Okay, so this first phase, you're figuring out key nutritional problems. Okay, and we're moving into phase two, nutrition diagnosis. This phase identifies nutrition problems, the root causes of their related signs and symptoms. This generates the creation of what we call a problem etiology, signs and symptoms statement to guide the phase three of the nutrition care plan. So a PES statement is needed for all nutrition assessment except those with no nutrition diagnosis. Three components make up the PES statement, the problem P, the nutrition diagnosis, the etiology E, the causes of the nutrition problem, the nutrition diagnosis, the signs and symptoms, the evidence that the, the evidence that the nutrition problem is. And the third, this, this takes us to the third phase where we're actually looking at nutrition intervention. And this is the stage at which you're actually figuring out what to do with the client. Nutrition intervention is a purposefully planned course of action with the client to positively change a nutrition-related behavior or condition or other aspects of his or her health status. Interventions may include, but are not limited to, individualized diet prescription, goal setting, nutrition education, nutrition advice, nutrition counseling, and to assist you in coming up with goals and, and what you need to do are the targets for blood pressure and biochemical measurements recommended for risk reduction in type 2 diabetes mellitus. And these are all highlighted and detailed in the guidelines. The final stage of the nutrition care process looks at dietary monitoring and evaluation, a very critical stage, because this is the stage where you're looking to find out if any progress was made based on the plan goals. And here I have, I'm going to run three um, quick um, algorithms, charts, if you want to call them, um, for three categories, lifestyle management for pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, then I do one for gestational diabetes and for type 1 diabetes. Most of them, all of them have some similarities, but a few minor differences. So we have nutrition. So when you're doing your goal setting, you really have to, to do your monitoring and evaluation based on the goals you set for nutrition, physical activity, alcohol consumption, smoking, and foot care. Okay, and when you go through, you have all the set information here, the goals, the targets that you want to reach. If it's achieved, fine, you are, you are on the road, you are good for self-management. And if you're not, then you will have to be referred to the specific um, or the relevant professional. And in some cases, you may even want to go to, 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 go to some specialized group. With respect to smoking and pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes mellitus, it is not recommended. For gestational diabetes, smoking and alcohol are not recommended. And in the other areas, again, you look to see if the targets are met. If it's achieved, they are self-managing well. The others still need to be um, counseled and worked on with the, um, uh, with the professional, the dietitian, if it's nutrition, physical activity, expert, and so on and so forth. And then you come to type 1 diabetes, we're saying smoking is not recommended. And again, the usual. So all of these are there. And this is one of the major differences from the initial or the other documents that were produced in the past. These have a lot of graphics, infographics, um, uh, or algorithms up here that you can actually follow, look at it and follow, and they're very easy to follow. Then we move on to nutritional information guiding um, healthy choices. And of course, this is one that's very familiar to dietitians and nutritionists. This is where we have to be looking at the food, but we want to guide the individual. Remember, this is lifestyle counseling. So it's not for us to just read this document and keep it for ourselves as a reference. So we we'll know we need to share it with the client. And we try to do things in this one where they can actually use their hand, that we call our hands on. So we say carbohydrates can be taken in portions the same size as the top of your closed fist vegetables in quantities equivalent to a fistful, fats in volumes equal to one joint of your thumb, and proteins in amount the size of the palm of your hand. I'm not going to go through those. And of course, you know the six food groups. And of course, we also have a table um, with guidelines and graphics that is actually showing hands-on. So it has food groups, what's in it, how to eat, when to eat, what to eat, what to avoid eating, and eating, and of course, reading labels. 
And I couldn't help but put up the reading labels here. It's very important. Now, you know, um, ADA brings out, um, actually, FDA, sorry, um, produces labels based on new findings from research. And we now have a new label that you see here that says new label, where certain things are highlighted. The serving size now appears larger because before it's so small. That's one complaint um, clients have with respect to reading labels. To find, they have eye problems, they can't see. So this is highlighted. Calories are now displayed larger. Daily values, we now have vitamins and, and potassium listed. And of course, the daily values of vitamins and minerals. And of course, there's a new cookie. So I will not harp on this. It's very comprehensive. We'll, we'll go to the document. We have to, we've had to discuss fasting because we know that in our region, we have um, a variety of, of religious bodies and religious beliefs. Some persons fast as a means of cleansing their bodies or whatever, um, but there are persons who fast because of religious beliefs and we really need to deal with them very carefully. So if the individual who is fasting has type 2 diabetes mellitus, special cautions should be adhered to. Fasting is not advised for persons with type 2 diabetes mellitus who have poor glycemic control, recent episodes of unawareness, acute illness, chronic kidney disease, um, unexplained ketoacidosis, and so on, and of course, for persons who are pregnant. And again, this slide is not ready for you to read, but it's there. This is the other section that looks at physical activity guidelines. We're going to have some a presentation on this today, but just to let you know that in the guidelines, you, uh, you have tips um, with respect to recommendations for physical activity, and these are developed by WHO, and we have recommendations for children and youth age 5 to 17, for adults 18 to 64, and then for adults 65 years and over. Now, the guidelines for self-management is another section, and this is important because you really want to know, make sure um, that persons understand what they have to do so that they can go home and actually manage their condition. So education is critical to that for self-management. And we're saying here that the, the few times that you see the clients would need to at least at these four stages to discuss anything with which, any knowledge you can give them with respect to nutrition or their emotional health. I'm saying data diagnosis at the annual assessment of education and nutrition and emotional needs, when new complicating factors influence self-management and when transitioning care occur. And of course, you, there, there are pointers here as to what you really want, uh, information that you want to give them so that they can actually self-manage. The next section looks at risk behavior, avoidance, smoking and alcohol. And it says, if you think the client may have problems controlling their alcohol intake, they should be questioned using the PH questionnaire. And it's there in the document in figure six. And it says, you know, have you ever tried to cut down on drinking? Have you ever gotten angry or annoyed when, when others speak about your drinking? Have you ever felt guilty about your drinking? Have you ever had an eye opener? That is first thing in the morning you want to have a drink. So you do that. I'm not going to go into these. Um, in the manual, in the guidelines, it tells you how much is a, is a drink, you know, how much for women, how much for men, and so on. Now, this is the last section I want to go to, and it's very critical and it's very dear to my heart because I believe that managing diabetes has to be a team approach, and this is, is highlighted in the guidelines. The interventions in the immediate aftermath of a type 2 diabetes mellitus diagnosis are aimed at modifying risk behaviors, identifying incipient complications, and for stalling target organ damage that has not yet occurred in the individual. So you really want for it not to progress that way, you want persons to manage and live a normal life. While risk factors and potential complications may be identified by the values in physician in the initial history, physical examination and clinical investigations, the management of the health issues identified requires a team approach. And I pull out this particular person from the team because we're all familiar with the nurse, the physician, the endocrinologist and so on, but the certified diabetes educator. I think we are few and far but probably plays a critical capacity building role in equipping the new type 2 diabetes mellitus client to handle both the diagnosis and initiation of management. 
this they provide they provide support with self management, including self monitoring of blood glucose, self administration of medications, monitoring of side effects of medications, and looking out for symptoms and complications. And this year is just showing you the infographic with the team. And we have a tier that is near the client and then a tier that is outside. And I'm going to speak to that quickly and we wrap up. So we're saying the client in conjunction with the primary care physician are the certified, certified diabetes educator and the United States they call them diabetes care and education specialist. All the nurse will engage in joint assessment and decision making regarding the need for and the frequency with which each of the relevant services will be assessed or access, sorry. The core interventions for all clients involve the modification of dietary and physical activity practices and the self-monitoring and care. Those embarking on the pharmacological management will additionally need to ensure adherence to the regimen provided. Now the services provided, providing this core support are depicted in the part of the inner tier management support. So the nurses, the nutritionists, um, the podiatrists and so on. Assessment, prevention, and management of target organ damage is the domain of the array of clinical specialists depicted in the outer tier of the model. So you have the obstetrician, the endocrinologist, the vascular, vascular surgeon, and so on. And this is my last slide. Again, difficult to read, but not meant for you to read. Um, in the guidelines, you have this um, referral chart, and it actually tells you if you have a problem, who you should go to very quickly it's a nice visual and with this i would like to say thank you very much and i hope that i have enticed you to use the guidelines so that you can work with clients so that they can actually self-manage their diabetes in the thank you for your attention thank you dr bakaj for taking us through model two of the guidelines very exciting very informative and I'm encouraging everyone to download the guideline on our website and um, the link will be um, provided to you in the chat. So as we move on to our next presentation from our, another expert from Trinidad and Tobago, or next, the next topic that we will be covering this evening is nutrition, diabetes, and COVID-19. Our presenter is Ms. Alicia Surajlal, and she currently holds the position of senior dietitian at the Port of Spain General Hospital, where she has been practicing for the past 12 years. She is a graduate of the University of the West Indies and holds a master's degree in human nutrition, public health from the London Metropolitan University. She's also a Caribbean certified diabetes educator. In her professional career, she's the current chair of the Nutritionist and Dietitian Board and Representatives to the Council for the Professions Related to Medicine. She has, was also a past president of the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Nutritionists and Dietitians, Tandy. Additional, Additionally, she has served on several committees, including the Cabinet Appointed Committee, Partners Forum for Non-Communicable Diseases, and the Nutrition Standards Committee for Food Served Sold in School. And most recently, as part of the working groups for the CARFA Guidelines for Diabetes Management in Primary Care in Caribbean. She expresses that her most important role is being a mother to one beautiful daughter. And I sh I'm sure many of us can identify with that. She comes really well placed to speak to us on this topic. And so I hand over to Ms. Rojlal at this point in time. Welcome and thank you. Good evening to everyone, um, to everyone who has taken the time to join us today. Thank you to Dr. Tammy for that welcoming introduction and to Dr. Bokaj for enlightening us on module two, such a comprehensive look. Um, I would like to thank and express my thank you to CARFA 
for the opportunity to present this evening and for recognizing the role of nutrition and dietetic health professionals in the management of diabetes, especially with the emergence of COVID-19. Just like the other members of the healthcare team, our professionals had to quickly rethink operational practices to ensure that our services were meeting the needs of our population while taking into consideration the safety guidelines for both staff and public. My presentation therefore aims to highlight some of these changes implemented, look at the challenges currently being faced and discuss some of the nutrition strategies to assist with improving blood glucose control whilst keeping the client-centered approach which the CARFA Module 2 seeks to as part of supporting lifestyle changes. So I hope you enjoy the next 15 minutes. So, this is an outline of my presentation, um, generally to look at what the nutrition core management is for um, diabetes, the overview of the nutrition care process from a different perspective um, in terms of actually what is taking place right now and how that process is being um, reinvented for want of a better word. Some of the challenges that we are facing, the opportunities that we can look at and the way forward. So first off, um, what is the goal for medical nutrition therapy for diabetes? And what we want to aim for is to maintain blood glucose as close to normal. Now, this will vary from person to person, as some persons are unable to achieve what is considered a normal reading for various reasons, including age and access to medication. Our role, therefore, is to work with the patient to assist them in developing some strategies to prevent fluctuations in their blood glucose um, levels. Secondly, to also prevent and treat complications of diabetes, such as cardiovascular and renal, and monitoring weight gain. And again, as in dietitians, professionals, and nutritionists, we look at some of the existing literature, which is proven, such as the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, which aims to look at cardiovascular health. And of course, our role is to improve overall health by promoting healthy food choices. All right, so this diagram, I would spend some time just explaining for non-nutrition persons how this approach, how we deal with this approach. So we'll start with the inner, inner circle, which we know as the edine, right? So we start, Ms. Bokaj would have um, introduced the nutrition assessment, which is a screen to capture information and then lead into the nutrition diagnosis. And for, for those of us, we know that one client can exhibit multiple nutrition diagnoses. So the professional needs to capture that information from their assessment. And of course, developing targeted interventions um, in whatever form to really meet the need of that client. And what is an intervention without monitoring and evaluation? So we need to ensure that our patients are progressing and if they are not, re-evaluating our plan and seeing what is the next step? The outer circle of our profession, so abiding by our code of ethics, uh, maintaining skills and competencies, which I'm sure a lot of persons will be tuned in tonight to gain that um, continuous professional development as we look into the next realm of, of diabetes guidelines. And communication is very important. Uh, Dr. Boka spoke about the collaboration with other members of the healthcare team. Um, so collaboration and communication. And of course, our clients are not in a bubble. We do have to be mindful of the economic situation that we're in. I would have uh, seen a recent webinar originating from the US recently where they talked about the availability to food um, with respect to food. And what they are saying is that there was no uh, change in food availability. What was happening, the food shortages that were seen were as a result of persons bulk buying and hoarding. And um, there have been no reports here um, to my knowing that there have been any food shortages, but keeping abreast and knowing what is happening. There, there have been, however, job losses. So we have to be mindful of what is happening just in our country in Trinidad, Ministry of Labor would have reported 2,262 jobs um, lost between January to October. So we must be cognizant of what is going on and what social systems are in place to address these things within our area. And of course, 
the ever evolving and ever changing healthcare systems. So we would have started at the beginning with um, being sort of being led in the blind, and then we've now come to a bit more stability in the healthcare system with COVID-19. So as things emerge and develop, and, and as they continue to evolve, healthcare services will ultimately be adjusted. So I'll start off with the first step and how COVID-19 has thrown some, some new challenges away and, and what we are doing to really adjust with the, this process. So in terms of nutrition assessment, um, on average, a nutrition consult can take about 45 minutes to 60, 60 minutes with one client. What we have seen is a reduction in that face-to-face -face contact time. And again, in healthcare settings, they have been reducing, in the initial part, they were reducing the number of persons coming in. They were also restricting um, persons, older adults in public settings. So we had to also um, adjust our um, role, our interventions based on that. So what we did is introduce some aspects of telehealth, which was the telephone um, to engage clients via telephone with very um, minimal video conferencing happening. And again, there would be some challenges with, te with technology, especially for our older adults. Um, Dr. Bokaj would have mentioned the ABCD. Uh, again, how do we do this via phone? Some of the challenges we face would have been um, some persons don't have access to, to skills. However, how do we get around this? So um, asking clients, have they noticed any change in the way their clothing is fitting them? Is it fitting loosely? Is it fitting tighter? Um, use of a measuring tape, that sewing tape that most persons have. All right. Another issue we have encountered is a number of persons are actually missing their clinic appointments. They are not coming in for their routine um, assessment, again, due to fear. Um, and again, some of them are not monitoring their blood glucose at home uh, because of they may not have strips available, testing strips, the glucometer is not available. And also some of them are act actually expressing fear to test their blood glucose because they have not been practicing their guidelines. Right. For again, a nutrition assessment, clinical signs. When a telephone um, uh, telephone meeting is had, there is no visual assessment of a client, so we are not able to see those clinical signs. And dietary for D, 24-hour recall, unusual intake. Again, this is what we base our interventions on. In module. Two, in module two, sorry, the appendix will have a nutrition screen and form which captures this information. So it gives an example as well as a usual intake and recall form. So then we use this information to make our diagnoses. What we are seeing commonly coming up, these are the international language for diagnoses, and these are some of the com common um, domains that uh, keep coming So limited adherence to nutrition related recommendations. What is happening is that grandparents are now being engaged in spending more time doing homeschooling of which you're learning with their grandchildren, which is actually limiting their time spent with meals and also time for physical activity. So this has been, this has been affecting their um, access to making good food choices. It is also um, reducing their physical activity level. Again, like I mentioned, there's still a fear with older adults in terms of um, limiting their outings and relying on family members to sustain their, their um, food intake. There's also some changes in health priorities with limited income, food choices are often affected as persons are making decisions based on the family needs and not regarding their health at this time. So these are some of the things that we are seeing um, in the population at this time. So what type of interventions are being developed? I about the concept of national interviewing. And again, we would like to applaud CAFA for introducing this fairly newer concept. And it actually helps to empower 
questions to be part of their blood rather than telling them what they should do. It also helps to build a level of trust with the healthcare provider. Um, so it's more or less the healthcare providers basically retraining the way we speak to clients from a closed question type of approach to a more open-ended um, approach. Uh, of course, this will take additional time. However, it may result in better compliance. So for instance, um, a goal setting uh, at the end of a session, a client might say, well, I will aim to eat one fruit a day or exploring activities with physical activity. So doing a 15 minute walk around the home. Again, interventions for persons with reduced income or limited income will explore social support, what avenues are available. And we talked about the whole mental health concept and how now as um, healthcare professionals, we are now having to express and give out more ma stress management tips for our clients because sometimes they come into a session and their minds are so stressed by what is happening in their daily life that sometimes discussing nutrition is not the focus of the session. So we must be mindful of these things and develop our interventions accordingly. Of course, we need to evaluate and monitor what is being done and engaging relatives and caregivers, supporting the clients and doing follow-up assessments is part of this. Um, I would say that given clients the options to, to keep a food diary, keep a self-monitoring log and an activity log serves dual roles. Because again, it puts the, the client in, to be empowered. It helps them to see, hey, look, my by eating this way or doing these exercises, I can see the pattern my blood glucose is like, so they can actually see trends for themselves. And it also helps the healthcare provider to make decisions on the client's healthcare because they do keep a record. So it serves a win-win situation. Of course, when we get these, we evaluate and make recommendations to move on with your clients. So that really encapsulates the whole nutrition care process and how now with COVID-19, we've been making steps to really make those changes in light of what is happening to get better results. I do want to step into um, what, again, some of the social issues that we are seeing um, with our clients. I think as healthcare providers, we should be sensitive at this time to the population needs. There are many times we would hear comments made from different healthcare professionals advising um, persons be, to eat certain types of quote-unquote health foods to manage their diabetes. Patients therefore leave with this notion that to manage their blood glucose, um, that healthy eating is expensive, and again, this is where our role becomes even more important to dispute these claims and therefore be the agents to highlight and show persons that despite social challenges, there are still practical tips which can be done to achieve good blood glucose control. For example, if persons receive monetary grants, sharing how they can do a food budget, what items should be purchased, looking at canned and dry food products, where they source their vegetables and fruits from local, um, local market stores as opposed to the supermarket, which will be more expensive. And if clients are receiving food hampers, explaining to them how products in these hampers can be used to really transform into healthier options. So for instance, if canned goods are provided, they can rinse or using cheaper types of high fiber foods to add additional fiber to products such as oats and cornmeal into white flour to make you know, the traditional bakes and bread. So you do have ways that you can modify to get a better product. So again, being mindful of what is happening with your clients at this time and not just giving advice, but really listening to their needs. So all is not lost. We do have a lot of opportunities ahead. Um, of course, being food secure is at, at, at everyone's wish. Um, again, as healthcare providers, being able to provide that information, um, giving them tips and telling them what they can do. So what I get, what are some of the things we are seeing an increase in home gardening um, persons have been telling us that um, COVID-19 having them indoors more has really made them appreciate the importance of, of uh, um, being more food secure growing their own crops they're proud of their gardens they're actually asking for recipes and how to 
to prepare these lovely items that they're producing and they're so proud they're coming with pictures from their garden so this is really good because in addition to um, providing healthy nourishing food it also gives the benefit of getting some additional physical activity again providing tips for bulk cooking so our parents, our grandparents who are there and having to provide um, coverage for school, they can prepare their meals in bulk and showing them how to properly freeze and tour. And again, with persons who have reduced incomes, knowing when to buy when there's a glut on the market or things that are in season, how to safely prepare, freeze, and how to store, tour and store their foods is important. So again, promoting our locally grown fruits and vegetables. And of course, um, COVID-19 has passed out on the whole fact of quality family time. I think persons have forgotten that cooking is a life skill and engaging our kids and our younger ones or teenagers from an early age is a good life skill that they can take on um, throughout all of their years. And again, we're thinking what is physical activity. So if you can find the home, what options are there? Um, even within an apartment, there are things you can do. Persons now uh, have been turning to YouTube for their exercise activities, dancing within the home, using um, things within the home to form their own personal gyms, because gyms and parks have been closed and slowly reopening. So, you know, knowing what is available and what we can discuss with our clients and make those healthy lifestyle changes. And the way forward, finally, um, being part of the overall process with our clients and being mindful of our roles as healthcare providers, um, getting ourselves involved in these government programs to provide food grant relief so that um, appropriate food choices, nutrition information, nutrition tips can be actually part. Reviewing our public health education um, programs and initiatives. I think sometimes we forget that these things need to be reviewed in the context of what is happening now. So we give literature and we pass our brochures and have programs running, but it does not take into account what is currently being experienced. So we need to be more engaging with our radio, print, television, social media, like what CAFA is doing today, to provide these updates to ensure that um, not only us as professionals, but the public is educated as we aim and strive to have better blood glucose control. And again, we really want to thank CAFA for these guidelines. They are available. They can be used for references. And I would like to acknowledge uh, persons within my sphere in Trinidad and Tobago who would have assisted in providing some of the nutrition information for this presentation. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for again, again for an excellent, superb presentation, taking us through a fundamental critical area of medicine, which is nutrition prescription. I, I like to frame it in that way because it's a critical component of good health. Without good and proper nutrition, you can't obtain good health. So, that leads us on to another exciting presentation. And this presentation will look at diabetes and physical activity. And our next presenter is Mr. Keys Fogel. Mr. Keys Fogel is the Director of Health Promotion and Education at the Ministry of Health and Wellness in Jamaica a position she has held for 16 years with her previous two years within the ministry being spent as a behavior change officer. She has spearheaded the planning and implementation of the public education response to varied disease outbreaks and been at the helm in the coordination of health promotion strategies for the prevention and control of NCDs in different settings. She has guided the development of many national and strategic plans, of which the most recent would be the cabinet approved Jamaica Moves in School program, as well as a health promotion strategic plan for NCDs 2020, 2021 to 2025, which is being finalized. Physical activity as a critical risk factor currently exists as a national program within the health promotion unit. 
But Ms. Fogo currently has, has as a part of her strategic plan to make it a subunit to facilitate greater resource support for it as a critical behavior to improving the prevention and control of NCDs. Her tenure at the Ministry of Health and Wellness has seen many advances being made in population-wide physical activity through the development of relevant and critical IC materials by the officer tasked with that responsibility and a significant boost to activities that came with, within the inception of the Jamaica Moves program in 2017. At this time, it's my pleasure to hand over to Mr. Keith Fogel, Director of Health Promotion and Education, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Jamaica. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Davidson. Thank you to PAFO for having me uh, make this presentation. I would like to acknowledge the, the team from CAFO and uh, colleagues, you know, that I have online. As Walk up and I look in the mirror and every part of my body was I happy I live. I Sorry about that. So I just want to, to acknowledge you, my esteemed panelists. Uh, a pleasant good evening to everyone. And right now I'm going to just take you through uh, physical activity, how, how Jamaica has used physical activity in its prevention and control efforts for NCDs and in particular diabetes. I want to acknowledge at the start of it that this presentation, a significant um, contribution to this presentation was made by our senior health education officer, Ms. Charmaine Plummer, who has responsibility for physical activity. And she's also online as well. So I'm going to start with just a few Walk up and I look in the mirror and every part of my body was in place. Many people died and never saw this day. So another day I live, I appreciate I like to, we like to start with that because we really have to be thankful for the fact that we can move, you know? We are able, we have hands, feet, different parts of our body that we can actually move and become physically active. So we start with that. But just to share that for the presentation, I'll be looking at very briefly, global status of physical inactivity some statistics in Jamaica, our capacity building of healthcare providers, physical activity and diabetes IC materials, our partnership with teacher training institutions, uh, diabetes patients in motion, some of our guidelines and our guide for school, workplaces and communities. So, you know, physical inactivity still has not yet reached the level that we would want to see it as in terms of acknowledging just the extent to which it can actually negatively impact persons, even as this slide shows you kill. So insufficient physical activity or physical inactivity actually is the fourth leading behavioral risk factor for NCD. And it can kill. It's, it's showing here that one point, an estimated number of 1.6 million die annually from insufficient physical activity. And just to show you that inactivity does cause 9% of premature mortality worldwide. It contributes to breast cancer, colon cancer, coronary, um, coronary heart disease, and type 2 diabetes. And you can see the figures as it relates to Jamaica causing 12.8% of our all-cause mortality and in particular causes um, an estimated percentage of 13% of breast cancer, 14% of colon cancer, 8% heart disease and 10% of type 2 diabetes. And so what does our Jamaica statistics show? 
we have done our third Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey in 2016, 2017. And what it showed us is that it, within the last year when they had done it, that 52% made no attempt any at all to increase their physical activity. And what exactly was their level of physical activity or inactivity? So 2%. 2% alone were doing high intensity activity, 16% doing moderate intensity activity, and 82% engaged in low intensity activity. And we know that the low intensity activity is basically equal to being inactive. So what is it that we have sought to do that would help our prevention and control efforts? as it relates to NCDs and as we said, um, and we can look at diabetes in particular. So we have built uh, the capacity of our healthcare providers. We are not exactly where we would want to be, but we are thankful for the steps that we have been able to make with different members of our healthcare teams. Including our medical doctors, our nurse practitioners, our senior public health nurses. And we have also done physical activity basics for our health education officers because our health promotion team does have the, the mandate of, of doing a physical activity. That is where uh, physical activity is host. As I mentioned, it, it's not yet a unit, it operates as a program and it's a program under the health promotion and education unit. So our health education officers are key in being able to promote this message and advance the physical activity agenda. Our community health aides are also important and we have done some capacity building with other healthcare workers. What has been some of our IC or information education and communication materials that have assisted with um, capacity building in this area would be our, for our chronic care model guide, we have incorporated a physical activity curriculum within it. For our lay diabetes educators training curriculum, we also have incorporated a physical activity curriculum in it as well. We now have a physical activity and diabetes brochure, which you know, speaks specifically to what uh, two important steps that persons with diabetes can take in managing their diabetes using physical activity. Of course, as the doctor, uh, um, their medical, practitioner would have advised. What else have we done? We have partnered with the physical education departments of teacher training institutions. What was the goal? To implement a structured activity program for client staff in health centers, health departments over periods of one year in the St. Catherine and the Kinson and St. Andrew area, which for those of you who know, that's the, the parishes that have the bulk of our Jamaican population, over 50% about that in these parishes alone. And so the aim was to provide quality physical activity trainers to conduct physical activity session and activities that are age, fitness level and condition appropriate for staff and clients. It demonstrated the various types of physical activity that can be done at home with little or no equipment. And of course, it was a win-win situation because the students would of course benefit from being a part of this. And so um, GC Foster Sports College and Nutrition University, I'm sorry, I said nutrition, I'm not, College and Michael University, uh, they partnered with us to plan and implement effective programs that promote physical activity for client staff of the Ministry of Health and Wellness healthcare facilities. And these are 
um, some key universities, certainly GC Foster Sports College will be known to many in the Caribbean because that is our major physical education and sports college. And so what would happen is that students who are part of the two-year personal trainer program did their field experience practicum at these health facilities. And for Michael, the same was done, except there, there were also students who had community service. And so they were able to plan and implement physical activity programs for clients and staff, bearing in mind that we now would have had at health centers these exercise programs being developed under the chronic care model. There are specific diabetes days where it's you know, dedicated to our diabetes patients and they would have some specific programs with them. My button is not working, sorry about that. Let me try. Sorry about that. So here we would have diabetes patients in motion. And, you know, instead of putting it in writing, you can see it for yourself. You see them in, you know, different areas. This is within one of the health departments. We found areas for them to do their different activities. And some we did on the outside of the health center and all gave this positive response. There were persons who really improved in the way that they were able to control their diabetes. It was actually a very excellent program. Uh, it is not running quite adequately right now, but we still have the partnership and we're looking for ways to you know, restart and see how we can continue on a more permanent basis to do these activities. All right, it's important for me to just share this because, let me stop it one second, just, sorry. I just want to say, you know, we one of the things that we do as part of our prevention efforts, as part of control efforts, is to remind persons that when they have been sitting for a long time, they need to get up and move. And if they can't get up, at least move right where they are. So I take this opportunity to take just a few seconds to put in our love your body, treat your body right. And just for a few seconds, I just want you to go ahead and just move your bodies. I know Dr. Davidson is ready. I see her there. <laughs> so. Unfortunately, where I am, if I get up, you might not see. If you're hearing it, come in. One, two, three, two more, one. I does the 30 minutes activity daily Love your body, treat your body right Vegetables, make sure you eat plenty Children do 60 minutes activity daily Drink some water when you feel thirsty Cut down dessert and have a smoothie Show me your cans Love your body, treat your body right Love your body, treat your body right Just eat right Love your body, treat your body right Love your body, treat your body right One more time now Love your body, treat your body right Love your body, treat your body right Just eat right Love your body, treat your body right Love your body, treat your body right Listen up Make sure you know your health status Go a doctor and get a regular checkup. Chronic disease can slowly creep up We can lower the risk and live up If we just eat right and get moving Jumping, running, dancing or skipping Chain the children, them lazy a bit Make them play out the door and put down the table Jummy your cans Love your body, treat your body right Love your body, treat your body right Just eat right Love your body, treat your body right Love your body, treat your body right all right, thanks to all those who were moving. So I know that my time might be out, so I have to continue. So I just want to highlight here our physical activity guidelines, which of course is important for us to have in different forms. Here you see it actually in our banner form, but we have them in flyer form as well. And uh, very important to us and, and a happy moment when we were able to do so is to, we launched last year the physical activity guide for persons with disabilities. 
and it's actually done in Braille. And so this was a very significant moment for us and it is the beginning of greater partnership with, uh, with the associations that deal with persons with disabilities as we want to ensure that our information is readily accessible to them. We speak to physical activity recommendation for older persons and we show them just some of the activities that they are able to do where they're getting their cardiovascular activities done, their strength activities, stretching activities. We have our recommendation for adults, the 30 minutes each day to gain health benefits, hour each day to lose weight, hour and 30 minutes each day to lose and maintain healthy weight. And then of course, we also have our recommendation for children and we break it into six to 17 years and four to five years. As it relates to school, because we're also speaking to our prevention efforts. So we have to get to the schools and start incorporating, helping them to see the importance of physical activity, not just doing um, physical education sessions every now and, and again, but to really incorporate the whole physical activity practices as an important part. So one of the things we've done is to, through our Jamaica Moves in School program, implement three five minute breaks. It's still in progress. We have done some cohort schools. We had a hundred schools. We are building up to another hundred. And at the same time, we promote it system-wide. So even though it may not be a part of the schools that we are able to monitor closely to see what are the gaps, it is being spread out widely. We also uh, speak to an additional one hour physical activity that they must get done for the week, different from the 15 minute breaks each day. We uh, thankfully were able to launch our annual um, National School Moves Day. That was a big move as well. They never had such a day. And we also were able to incorporate uh, various, sorry, I'm not, I think can't move. I think this is the extracurricular activity, just being able to utilize physical activity in our schools on a regular basis. In terms of our workplace, we have done some extensive work with varied workplaces. We have an activity guide and toolkit for the workplace that human resource uh, practitioners, wellness coordinators in the workplace can use to help to strengthen their physical activity component of the workplace wellness program. Very um, recent has been our wellness coordination coordinators checklist and that's specific to the personal trainers that many places are now able to employ or have for a couple of days. And it's important that we give them this list that they actually see if the person is doing what it is they're supposed to do. So we give them an idea, how are they working with persons who have underlying conditions? How are they you know, structuring the program? So that we have a series of, of, of things that they need to just sort of check off to know that they are on the right track. And then we have had varying fora where we show and demonstrate some simple things that can be done in the workplace and just as a way of citing them to start, you know, their physical activity component of the workplace. And of course, the gender wider wellness as well. And, and to help us, we, we are still doing capacity building sessions for human resource managers and wellness coordinators. So for our community, we have to look at who are our vulnerable groups. Our seniors are very vulnerable to so many things. And so we have really uh, worked along with our National Council for Senior Citizens, where we have looked at their needs and heard their requests. And we recently launched, as a matter of fact, on October 1, which was commemorated as the International Day for Older Persons, we launched our physical activity video, which speaks again to the endurance, the strength, the cardiovascular, and 
we have it out. They have, um, it's a 30 minute video in all, but we've broken it up also into three 10 minute videos, which they are featured as um, a part of. They are the ones demonstrating. And so we are really excited about this taking off even more and to continue to work with our senior citizens. And as mentioned earlier, persons with special needs, we know that we have not adequately met some of their concerns and, and given the kind of access that we would want to give to information. So we have them targeted. Ladies and gentlemen, there's so much more that could be said, but given the time and being obedient to the time, just want to leave you with it's important to be physical and be every day. More movement, more memories, more life. Motivate the mind, the body will follow. And so I just want to thank you right now. Thank you, Ms. Fogel, for another excellent presentation, of course, from the health promotion team, always full of vibes and promoting physical activity. So participants, we have had a very exciting night. We have gone through nutrition, physical activity, and really not nutrition and physical activity are not only there to just to promote general health but are critical tools in the management of diabetes. Every healthcare provider should be looking to ensure that anyone who is living with diabetes and those who are trying to reduce their risk of diabetes and other NCDs should have a prescription for nutrition and physical activity. This should be a central aspect of their treatment along with any medication that they may require and other types of modality. Certainly nutrition and physical activity impact on both the physical and mental well-being of everyone. And so this is what we should be seeing in the 21st century in modern medicine and the approach. And physical activity and nutrition being a part of the prescription for patients with diabetes is not new and it's something that we have been practicing for many many years so I, i'd just like us to really um, acknowledge all our presenters again um, dr bakash miss uh, suruj lal and miss Vogel, who have done an excellent presentation at this time we're going to just take some questions um, from the members and the audience and our first question here, and this is to Ms. Fogel. Um, what type of exercises would you recommend for someone who has diabetes and heart failure where the person is discouraged from partaking, partaking in physical activity? Ms. Fogel, any of our panelists would like to answer? Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, so I'm going to confess here that while I am in charge of the overall area, I could not speak very well to that area because we usually have our, well, our physical activity specialists that we have online who, as I said, significantly contributed to that would have been more apt to, to be specific with the conditions um, I, I know as well, some of the doctors would be able to address it. I don't know if in this case it is, but unfortunately I can't. I know uh, Ms. Plummer is on the line, but I don't know whether or not you would be able to hear our Dr. Davidson, if she's yes. one of the attendees. We can, we can have her go live. Um, team, can you just arrange for Ms. Plummer to go live and then I, I can supplement with any response to that question. And she heard. So in the meantime, um, meanwhile, um, I think there is another question um, to you, Ms. Fogel, mm -hmm. um, from our um, participants. 
what were the barriers preventing physical activity in Jamaica? Ah, no, that I can answer. <laughs> well, they get Miss Plummer. Um, I think it's because physical activity, it, it's something so many of us grew up with. So it's almost like you, you sort of take it for granted, all oh, that activity there, because we, we just grew up doing something. So this, it's almost as if you had to school persons into appreciating the importance of physical activity because it wasn't seen even in the school system where it is the physical, where you have physical education class. It's often the first class that is put aside if there's some challenge with curriculum. It's always, so it's the, the physical activity. I honestly believe that a great struggle that we had certainly in the earlier years is just getting even buy-in from leader, senior, senior persons to accept it as something worth investing in, in, in appreciating the role that it really does play in addressing our NCDs. I think that was not, there was not a full appreciation of it. And even the fact that as at this time, you know, it's, it's a program and hadn't been seen. You see, clearly we have a nutrition unit. We have an entity that deals with our tobacco use, our um, the harmful use of alcohol. You know, we have other units and a lot of resource put in, put in these risk factors, but physical activity never got that level of attention. So that was what we had to sort of fight against. And the real turnaround for us was when we had a great political will. We had a minister who was, well, even I would say a little prior to our minister, we had a permanent secretary that started to sort of help to push it to a national agenda type thing. And then um, our minute, current minister who really has, has really pressed the point you know, that, that this is one of the factors that we have to push through. Thank you so much for that question. Dr. Davidson, you are muted, I'm not oh, hearing you. Okay, thank you. Just to respond to the previous question, when prescribing um, physical activity, certainly you have to take into concern the person's medical condition. And in this case, the person has cardiovascular disease and heart failure. So any, for this person, you really want to ensure that any um, physical activity is done under the supervision of their medical practitioner and um, someone certified um, to assess really their ability to tolerate physical activity. But certainly walking is one of those physical activities that um, persons can engage in um, with both cardiovascular disease and heart failure. Again, um, even you have to really assess the individual patient and that should be done only with the prescription of their medical practitioner. And so um, I would advise such a patient um, that they would need to do that in collaboration with their doctor because I wouldn't be able to say, speak to their particular condition, to the severity of their condition and some of the other contraindications that may be. But certainly walking um, is, is, is one of the minimal um, types of physical activity that persons can do um, with um, cardiovascular disease and heart failure. However, it must be done, I, I can't overemphasize that physical activity must be done under the supervision of the medical doctor and based on their assessment of that individual patient because each these these are just guidelines and each patient is going to be different but no one should be engaging especially with these types of comorbidity in physical activity without doing a full medical assessment and there are other assessments that would that would be done by a trained expert in um, physical activity. Um, and they're, they're very in exercise physiology, um, in exercise prescription. Um, so that assessment must be done before engaging in physical activity, but certainly walking 
um, at a slow pace um, is something that you can do. But any sort of movement, even sitting in a chair and moving your legs, your arms, any sort of movement is, is good um, for health. And so I, that's the mantra, in fact. Um, any, you just want to just do any sort of movement. Any sort of movement is good for health. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions. Um, well, Dr. Davidson, they have unmuted. Ms. Plummer, and she's ready. Oh, to she's respond. great, great. So she can also add. All right, Ms. Plummer, please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, well, Dr. Davidson, you really covered it, you know, from the medical perspective that, you know, the individual will have to be assessed by their medical doctor. And what the medical doctor will do is to work now along with the personal trainer and explain to the personal trainer based on the condition, you know, these are the type of activities that the person can participate in. Then the trainer now will do another assessment to assess the fitness level of the individual. So we have assessed the medical condition of the individual. We now have to assess the fitness level to see, even though they are going to be walking, it might just be general walking, like it would just be for living. But if the doctor say, you know, based on the condition, they can do light to moderate, then the trainer will now step it up. And even with the moderate, is it maybe for a 10 minutes? It might not be for the recommended half an hour. It might be five minutes at a time. And as we progress and assess, you still liaise with the medical doctor to say, based on this activity, we see where the client is doing X, Y, and Z. And we progress according to the condition and how the patient is responding to the type of activities. And like Dr. Davidson said, any movement is good movement. So if you're sitting down, you know, you can be moving up your hands and your legs. But when you get into the structured program, though, it's very, very important to monitor the patient very, very closely. I would also recommend that the patient is not given the activities to be done by themselves in the beginning that the trainer will have to be there to say, okay, when you're walking, it might mean that you walk here for five minutes, you stop and you rest. And then we see if you can do another two minutes and so forth. So it's really, really critical to work together as a team and to ensure that you explain to the patients also, if you're feeling any discomfort, it is very critical to communicate with the personal trainer and then the personal trainer along communicate with the doctor and then we can assess and go again. So those are some things. We can go in more detail, but that is it in a synopsis. Yes, thank you, Ms. Plummel, for um, responding as well to this question and um, adding. So again, everything in health, um, I just want to emphasize, this is our second webinar on the diabetes guideline. But I just want to emphasize that the patient is at the center of the care. This is a team approach. And there are many different specialists that are part of this. And um, in, in many of your countries, there may be varied called by very different names, but this is a team approach which takes on many, many persons from different, different areas. And what we're doing is really facilitating the patient's care, getting them to optimal care, engaging that patient, patient-centered care. And so that is critical. Um, so thanks again, Ms. Plummer. Let us see if we have any other questions at uh, this time. I'm going to just invite us at this time, um, in the interest of time, we're going to run the second poll. And so I'm going to ask our team to just have our second poll up. Um, and in the interim, um, we will answer questions concurrently as we have our second poll. Dr. Davidson. Yes. I just wanted to acknowledge Shamdio's um, comment on, on safety in open spaces. And really, when I'd answered about the physical activity question, I, I did answer it from the perspective of what may have hindered it in terms of on the national agenda. I think um, the reference is also being made to just persons doing physical activity. And I would agree that that safety would be an issue in some cases, even in terms of the best infrastructure. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's boils down to safe, a safe, open, green space that they can actually utilize. We have some, but we know that more is wanting. So that may still remain somewhat as a barrier. And I think previously to 
persons when they thought of it, you know, they thought just exercise very structured and did not realize the extent to which when they're dancing and doing as movements as you and Ms. Plummer have spoken about, that they were getting, you know, their, their level of physical activity. And so in the last few years, our programs have definitely emphasized that area outside of a gym, because that's the other thing. Some persons think they had to go to a gym to be able to get the, the requisite physical activity. So showing persons options has helped to, to I think that, it, that was a barrier, thinking that it was only gym. So being able to show them the varied ways and things that they can enjoy while getting the um, physical activity done, that has helped to break down some of that barrier. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Ms. Fogel. And one of our participants added again, um, you know, re-emphasizes that physical activity really is movement and it can take many different forms. And he, this is uh, Weekly Smith who says household chores also offer good exercise opportunities. So says lifting your clothes hamper for a number of times before loading them in a washer. You can encourage walking in place while ironing clothes swinging the arms purposefully when sweeping the carpet. And you are so on point. We want to get movement going and you really can actually um, benefit from just some of these daily chores as a part of um, your physical activity. Um, and we also have another question, but I think this was answered in the earlier response with respect to patients that are taking oral meds and are entering um, CRF chronic renal failure, but do not want to be reviewed by internists and deny the use of insulin, what can we recommend for them? Well, what we can recommend is the importance of seeing, um, being under the supervision of a medical practitioner and being assessed for that patient before engaging in any such activity. Um, all persons with chronic illnesses should be followed up routinely by their medical practitioner. And if it is that they really um, want, they really are not relating to that medical practitioner, find someone, go on, find someone that you can work with, um, a physician um, that you can relate to, um, to, to get your care. There's nothing that says you have to go to one physician or the other, but it's important that you are under some care. And we do encourage and, and recommend for anyone who has a chronic illness should be in routine care under the care of a medical practitioner at all times. Um, I, I see another question from Enoch Cyprus. Will eliminating one comorbidity, say hypertension, greatly increase the health benefit to, to a diabetic? And certainly, yes. Um, certainly, yes, if you have both, if you have diabetes alone, that's one thing. If you have another comorbidity or several comorbidities, that worsens the course of the disease. And certainly having diabetes alone is, is, is better than having diabetes and hypertension. Um, so it's, it's you know, um, many of these lifestyle interventions, all of them, in fact, have a positive effect, not only on diabetes, but on also on hypertension, numerous non-communicable diseases not even mentioned. And um, in Ms. Fogel's earlier presentation, you saw the significant impact um, physical activity, for example, had on, in, on controlling or eliminating uh, or reducing death due to um, cancers, select cancers, and also cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So I think we are now, we have, finished answering all the questions for this evening. And um, I think we also have, I, I hope everyone, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to answer your poll while we do our wrap up and closing remarks. Um, and I'm going to invite each panelist just to give us some take home message um, based on your presentation. What are some of the key things you want to leave participants with? Um, at the end of this webinar. And I'll start with Dr. Bokaj 
And then uh, we move on to um, Ms. Suraj Lal and then Ms. Fogel. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. Um, I have a lot of take, take away things, but you know, the critical thing for me is, is, is working with um, dietitians and nutritionists and other health professionals who work with clients. I strongly believe that we need to boost our, our skills with respect to counseling because, you know, gone are the days where we do a diet sheet and we tell persons what they want to do. This is a conversation we need to have with our clients. And, um, you know, clients being the center of what we need to do is very critical. And we need to be able to, to have those, those skills um, really boosted so that we can work with clients for them to improve their self-management of diabetes. And, of course, working as a team and not in isolation. So that's my key. Thank you. Okay, um, these presentations tonight were really insightful and really, again, highlighted the, the whole team approach to healthcare and really keeping, as, um, as you say, Dr. Tamu, the client-centered approach. Um, so my take home is really um, looking to see what is happening with your patient, being sensitive and being aware as to what is taking place in their world at this point in time, and then providing your care from whatever perspective you are, whatever health professional you are, but really hearing the needs of your client rather than um, forcing information down their throats, once for a better word, but really giving that personalized care, and you will see you get better results. I know there was one question with persons who may be hesitant to visit a doctor, but sometimes um, actually listening, take any time out to hear, well, what are your concerns? What is the concern of, of, of preventing you from visiting? What are you scared about? You know, really take any time to listen um, to your client and addressing those concerns as best as you know. So again, keeping it client-centered. That's my take home for tonight. Yes, Ms. Fogel. Thank you, Ms. Fogel. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I said a little of it in, in answering, although I realized afterwards that the question about the physical activity, actually, um, I took it from a different angle than was initially asked, but I actually want to go back to the angle about the importance of physical activity. Um, I think it's very important. We're talking about diabetes. We're talking about management and care. We just want to ensure that physical activity is a part of the management and care. We unfortunately have found where it sometimes at a last resort when you know it may be mentioned or, but it's not. I see it increasingly happen, which we we are happy for, but. If I would want to leave anything, certainly for our healthcare providers or doctors on right now, it's to remember or to ensure that the physical activity is utilized as part of the management and care of our diabetes patients. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you have heard it from our specialist expert panelists. Yes, the importance of nutrition counseling, the importance of the exercise prescription critical to the care of the patient. But what is so important is you need to do this with the patient. The patient is at the center of this care. Every practitioner, whether it be a nutritionist, dietitian, medical doctor, um, whether it's a pharmacist, a phys physiotherapist, all members of the team, in fact, every single member of the team, even those who are non-medical, from the security to the cleaner in that health center, in that clinic, whether it's a private office, everybody is part of this holistic care and holistic approach to the patient, facilitating them reaching their target and their goal to be a healthier and productive person within the society. So this is the second part of our module we have two more exciting modules ahead for you. So please join us once again on November the 26th when we look at essential medicines and then on December the 3rd when we look at care of the caregiver. Please join us again. This is Care for COVID-19 Health Rounds. You have just heard our session on 
Module 2, and COVID-19. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Please remember, please remember that we need your feedback. We need your feedback to improve on what we're doing here tonight. So please complete your survey for us up on the screen. You can use the QR code link. We'll also, as usual, send you a reminder. Thank you, everyone, and over, and bye. Take care and work good. Thank you presenters for a wonderful session. Um, thank you.